work that I've been fortunate to have supported by the Vasculitis Foundation is looking at um, two components of, of kind of the immune system and an inflammatory response that um, we think might be important in egg-associated vasculitis, so monocytes and alpha-1 antitrypsin. Uh, so briefly, disclosures, um, consulting with Amgen and some research collaboration with Takeda. Um, getting into the outline for what we'll talk through, so just start with some background and current state of, of management of, of egg-associated vasculitis, probably a little review for this group, not, not super fresh information, but um, and then we'll get into, you know, why we're interested in monocytes and then why we're interested in alpha-1 antitrypsin and then kind of putting those together and what the next steps are, are going to look like. So good news, you guys know this, uh, good news, major advances in the last 10 to 15 years in, in management of, of vasculitis. We've gone from really blunt, you know, big hammer immunosuppression to some more targeted therapies that have come a long way with steroid sparings. Rituximab's changed the game. Avacapan's really uh, on the move. Mepolizumab for eGPA has made a big difference. So we're making a ton of progress. However, we know that relapse and infection still remain very, very common, and they can trigger each other. Right, so when you have relapse, immunosuppression gets ramped up, and then you're more prone to infections. And then the, the opposite is also true, that an infection can rev up your immune system and, and, and move toward disease relapse, and it's just a, a vicious cycle in that sense. Um, so as far as where to go from here with that, we know that, that there's a whole bunch of different clinical features of, of vasculitis, um, and with that, comes a different response to immune suppression. Some things are more likely to respond immediately, sometimes some things take longer, some things are really refractory, um, and that also brings a different risk of relapse and the, the risk of the immune suppression. Um, and then, you know, what do we have to tell us when relapse might be coming? So these markers, we've done a lot of work in this and, and we're still not great at predicting uh, what's gonna happen with relapse, um, but it does seem to differ a little bit in terms of what the features are uh, that are evolving. So are we really talking about apples and oranges even within the same disease, that things kind of take very different courses? So, you know, airway stenosis versus kidney involvement versus alveolar hemorrhage all have very different looks and responses to, to immune suppression through the disease course. So what it really comes down to is that we need to be able to predict relapses. We need to strike that better balance between the immune suppression or just treatment in general and the disease activity and kind of better align the intensity of the two um, for more targeted treatment, personalized medicine approach is really the goal. Um, so what are monocytes? Where do these come into play? So these are a, I'm gonna say underappreciated part of the immune system um, that uh, I think of them as kind of just the, the, night, the night security guards or something like that. Kind of always on surveillance, roaming around, trying to see what might be going on. They have these little, uh, antennae, if you will, these receptors on the surface that, that kind of detect uh, infections and other inflammation and that sort of thing and kind of raise the alarms and start talking to other immune cells and say, hey, something's going on here. Um, so we, we hear a lot about lymphocytes and neutrophils in, in vasculitis, right? So the lymphocytes, like Davi was saying, make the antibodies and the neutrophils we think are largely responsible for kind of the, the end organ uh, features that, that come about. So all these cells talk to each other and we're we're thinking that the monocytes are a little upstream, if you will, kind of giving that initial signal. Um, specifically in AAV, what we know is that they also express PR3 um, and MPO. Um, but for PR3, so this is, this is some of our, our early data, really just looking at how much PR3 is in a monocyte versus a neutrophil. Neutrophils certainly have more, um, but we see, we definitely see it in in monocytes as well, and, and what we don't know is, is how much, you know, what do the monocytes do? We have a lot of focus on neutrophils. Um, um, you know, what's the role of the monocytes here? Um, other things we do know about the monocytes, and this is some other, some other early data, is, is that IL-8 is a cytokine or an inflammatory um, protein that, that is put out by, by cells including monocytes, and so it's kind of one of those red flags that says, hey, neutrophils get to work, or something like that. Um, and so with this, we, we looked at um, healthy monocytes, but exposed to either um, monoclonal antibodies, meaning kind of engineered antibodies that go against PR3, or antibodies from patients. Um, and both of those antibodies targeting PR3 on the monocyte really 
augment that response. So the, the um, LPS, I should mention, is, is a signal that comes from specific bacteria. So it's sort of what we call primes the monocytes and kind of gets them, gets them perked up and says, hey, something's going on. But then, and that starts the process, but then when the antibodies come in, things really rev up. So we think they're, they're really um, driving a lot of, of, of inflammatory response and have a, a lot of communicating that's, that's going on. Um, a little more in AAV, so the questions that, that are still out there, right? So what is their actual function in the disease activity? Um, an interesting one that, that I wanna look at is, does the way that they show the PR3 differ from neutrophils? So um, some work from, from Dr. Specks um, that I was fortunate to be involved with along the way is was really getting into you know, the various um, components of the surface of PR3 and how the antibodies interact with that. And so does that differ between the cell types? And then finally, because they are these, um, you know, early detectors of, of trouble and, and that sort of thing, could they, are there things about um, the monocyte characteristics, some of those surface receptors or flags that they're showing that, that might um, give us clues about impending relapse? Uh, so taking the other side of things, so alpha-1 antitrypsin. So this is a protein uh, in the body that has a lot of anti-inflammatory effects. Um, one of them is regulating those surface receptors on monocytes, so kind of trying to, to dampen down some of, some of those responses. But also, um, it is the primary inhibitor of PR3. So largely in vasculitis, we think of PR3 as the target of the ANCAs, but it has a day job. So it's going around um, chopping up a lot of other proteins and, and contributing to inflammation in that way. And alpha-1 comes in and gets that to quiet down. Um, we also know that it's genetically linked to the risk of, of vasculitis. So people that have changes in the genes for alpha-1 antitrips gene, for alpha-1 antitrypsin, um, are at higher risk of developing uh, a vasculitis, and that's work done by our own Dr. Merkel, um, and then Dr. Lyons as well had a, a similar study um, that both corroborated that. So this is a little complicated diagram. I'll try to walk you through. So again, we have the neutral and the monocyte, and the little, little green kind of Pac-Men are the PR3, the ANCAs are the Y-shaped antibodies, and then the alpha-1 antitrypsin is kind of the blue blob. Um, and so what I really just wanted to show here is that what we know about alpha-1 is that it inhibits the PR3, so it stops the PR3 from doing its job, but it also blocks the interaction between ANCAs and the PR3. So it really interferes with, with that binding in the first place and the subsequent activation of those cell types. So it, it can really prevent those cell types from getting really revved up and, and, and driving more inflammation. What we don't know is how does um, a change in alpha-1 level affect what we're seeing of the PR3? So again, kind of what's exposed on the surface of that protein and how the antibodies might see it. Um, is that affected by the alpha-1 levels or, or the, the genes there? Um, is it helpful to follow levels of that over time? There are some data that maybe it correlates with the disease, both active and dysfunctional alpha-1. Um, and then what does it really do in terms of um, disease activity? You know, we, we, we know that it can have this, this role in terms of these interactions, but what does that mean clinically? So um, some initial work here, looking at patients enrolled in the VCRC uh, longitudinal study, um, there's been some work related to the genetic studies um, that, that Dr. Merkel and others had worked on before, you know, comparing the clinical features of patients who do and do not have abnormalities in the, the alpha-1 antitrypsin. And really what we're seeing is that, that it seems like there are some differences in the, in the types of manifestations depending on what that um, gene looks like. Um, and so that's, that's really gotten our interest in terms of um, where that could take us. And really, does it bring us back to this question of, is this a way to investigate the different types of disease features? So if we have this, this way to kind of separate groups of patients in terms of, of who has what manifestations, um, can that really open a door to investigate what's driving those different manifestations? Um, so trying to put it all together here, uh, again, really, the, the big focus next is if, we're, if we know that we're seeing some signals saying people with, with this kind of alpha-1 antitrypsin have these types of features um, versus another combination, 
does that really open the door to, to look at different pathways that are driving things in these different directions? Um, what does that mean for the alpha-1H trips and levels over time, the inflammatory markers? What does that mean for the interactions between the antibodies and, and the, the PR3 and the, and the cells? And then also, again, with the kind of surface exposure of the PR3, um, how does that differ between the neutrophils and monocytes, and, and what does that mean in terms of kind of any divergent um, activity and, and manifestations for, for the disease? So I'd really like to, to thank all of, all of my mentors uh, across the board here at OSU, Mayo, and Penn, um, and a huge thank you to the Vasculitis Foundation for the support and the, the uh, VCRC, um, and especially patients. So your participation in, in any of these longitudinal studies and clinical trials really is so, so important um, and, and so impactful to um, allow us to, to try to dig into things. So thank you. Um, we'll take questions for, for both investigators at the end, I think is what we will do. Um, and so I'll ask Dr. Fussner to st stick up here with me. It's really, hopefully everybody's putting together, there's like a lot of anxiety about relapse, both on the patient side and the physician and investigator side. And so much work is being done to try to predict that. Um, you know, looking through the whole symposium, in those first couple of sessions, there was just a lot of talk about what is remission, what is relapse, and then Dr. Hall's, I can't, I talk, everybody that talks to me knows I'm obsessed with uh, Dr. Daniel Hall's sessions that he had this time, talking about how to just deal with it on a patient level, and then hearing today about kind of some of the high science, working out how we pick that out is really interesting to me. You know, I'm a rheumatologist, I'm thinking about all the things a rheumatologist thinks about, but ha like in the in the cases that you of vasculitis that you follow, how how are you thinking about monitoring these patients? The patients in remission, what, how often are you seeing them? What tests are you doing to think about uh, monitoring them for relapse? Sure, great question. Um, so it, it depends on the patient, of course, um, how far they are into their disease, how long they've been in remission, what their um, initial manifestations were, mm -hmm. kind of how severe and acute, and that sort of thing. Um, um, so anywhere from kind of every three to six months or, or so when we're kind of in that active surveillance phase of, of trying to keep an eye on things. Um, I, I like to get all the blood work. Uh, I, I know there's a, some controversy about the ANCAs and, and all of that, but, but um, my training has, has, has uh, made me a believer for sure um, in keeping an eye on those. I, I do like to keep track of the B cells as well mm -hmm. in folks on rituximab. Um, and then depending on their pulmonary manifestations, you know, whether we're doing spirometry to see what, um, you know, how tight their airway seems to be in conjunction with their symptoms or some follow-up imaging to, to get a sense of things. Um, but that combination of things and then largely how the patient's feeling is, is the most important. Um, yeah, that's good. The pulmonary involvement of vasculitis is like truly fascinating. You know, it goes, it can affect the entire track, of course. Um, with the subglottic stenosis, the, the nodular lung disease that sometimes cavitates that I think many of you probably have experienced, and then the, uh, the drama that is bleeding in the lungs. Yes. So uh, you have your work cut out for you. You also, how much work do you do in the ICU? How, many how, many, uh, how much exposure do you have to the patients that are coming in ICU level ill? Sure. Uh, half of my inpatient time is, yeah. is ICU, and then half is is pulmonary consults roaming around the hospital. So right. definitely get to get to see a lot of it. And thankfully, we have very strong rheumatology and, and nephrology teams as well that we can uh, collaborate with on on some of those folks. But um, but definitely definitely intense when they're yeah <laughs> when they when they first come in. Walk us through that the pulmonary ICU doctor's perspective of a patient bleeding from their lungs. Uh, scary to <laughs> to start with. Um, I'll say it that way for sure. Um, you know, many do end up on on mechanical ventilation, um, and so one of the challenges up front is identifying that that's what's going on, right? Because mm -hmm. there, as you guys know, it's not not the most common reason that that people have any of any of these issues, and so um, really having that suspicion in the first place um, can go a long way because um, it can look just like um, our, our far more common lung injuries and and um, ARDS that maybe is a more familiar term thanks to COVID, but um, 
it can look just like that. And so the, the history from the patient and family is enormous in kind of raising our, our uh, suspicion for, for more of a systemic process like that going on. Um, so that, that's super, super important. So any, any indication that anyone can give about, you know, what was going on leading up to this, what symptoms, you know, uh, we're always looking at, at the, I'm, I get a UA on everyone all the time yep. <laughs> to see if there's anything there that could kind of signal. Uh, That's how we know you're a vasculitis doctor, <laughs> is that you're getting a urine sample. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, all right. And with that, we will move on. Thank you, Dr. Kostner, um, for improvising with me. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Aravala, we'll get you back up on the stage. All right. Let's give her a good proper welcome here. <laughs> Thank you. So today I'm going to discuss about our study about the comparison of the cardiovascular risk in patients with vasculitis and diabetes. So essentially the aim of this study was to understand whether the risk of cardiovascular disease in patients with vasculitis is as high as in those with diabetes. So just a little bit of background to understand why we decided to do this study. Uh, there are different studies actually showing that one of the most common causes of death in patients with vasculitis, specifically ANC associated vasculitis, is cardiovascular disease. Actually, this risk can peak as early as three months after diagnosis. And some of these risks can be explained by the long-term use of steroids, but not all of that. Also, some authors actually have you know, recommended a formal assessment of this risk uh, as frequent as every six months. So why patients with vasculitis actually have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease? Well, it's because it, uh, there is inflammation of the blood vessel wall. So this inflammation can activate different pathways. And one of those pathways is actually, you know, leads to the development of blood clots, for example. And besides that, also patients can have traditional uh, risk factors for cardiovascular disease, such as high blood pressure, high cholesterol levels, et cetera. This was a retrospective study. So what retrospective study means is basically a study that looks backwards to try to look for associations between suspected risk factors and outcomes. Uh, we use a national database that is based on ICD-10 codes. Uh, we look at different types of vasculitis. We group them into, into three different large groups. The first was large vessel vasculitis, the second was ANCA associated, and the last one was other vasculitis, in which we included patients with Bechet's, uh, polyarteritis nodosa, and cryoglobulinemia. We assessed primary and secondary outcomes. The primary outcomes was basically all-cause mortality, risk of heart attacks, of a stroke, minor stroke, blood clots. And as secondary outcomes, uh, we assessed the risk for atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, peripheral vascular disease, and also metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is a cluster of risk factors that are specific for cardiovascular disease. We adjusted our analysis for different confounders. And basically, um, uh, 109,000 patients had vasculitis. Uh, close to 32.5 million patients had diabetes. What is highlighted with the red arrow um, was more prevalent in the diabetes population, so meaning patients with diabetes had a higher prevalence of hypertension, obesity, high cholesterol levels, uh, previous heart attacks, and um, as expected, of course, uh, the long-term history of steroid use was more prevalent in the vasculitis group. So what we found is actually that there is a higher risk uh, of mortality, a stroke, blood clots, atrial fibrillation, and peripheral vascular disease in the vasculitis group when compared to the patients with diabetes. So we can actually, this graphic I think represents much better what I just mentioned. We can see that there was an overall increase in all the risk. And we also took a look at subgroup analysis. So in terms of the large vessel vasculitis, um, we can see that there is actually an increased risk of minor stroke, the one that is highlighted with the red arrow. And there was also an increased risk of peripheral vascular disease, the one that is highlighted with the blue arrow. In terms of ANCA-associated vasculitis, I would like to highlight that the majority of this group um, involve GPA patients. 
So in this uh, subgroup analysis, we saw that there was an increased risk of blood clots. And in the other vasculitis group, um, we actually also saw an increased risk of peripheral vascular disease as the large vessel vasculitis group. So again, I think this graphic uh, explains much better what I just mentioned. And then we can see that the majority of the cardiovascular risk in vasculitis patients um, was given by the large vessel vasculitis group, which is highlighted in the dark blue bars. The blue ones are the anca associated vasculitis patients, and the light blue is basically the other vasculitis, such as PAN, cry uh, cryoglobulinemia, and Bechet's. So what we can conclude, we conclude that basically patients with vasculitis have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease, including blood clots. Our study confirms the high cardiovascular risk in patients um, with vasculitis, as it has been highlighted in previous studies, and also suggests even a higher risk when compared to patients with diabetes. And again, I would like to highlight that the majority of this risk was given by the large vessel vasculitis group, followed by GPA patients. I will also um, like to clarify that we have limitations because of the nature of the database that we use. Uh, as this is based on ICD-10 codes, we couldn't access to laboratory data, for example, and catheters, et cetera, and we couldn't have access also to the medications that patients were receiving, although there is an ICD-10 code for long-term use of steroids, so we were able to adjust our results for that. So essentially, what does means for us as providers? So first of all, to be aware of the increased risk of cardiovascular disease in patients with vasculitis, so that we can screen our patients for traditional risk factors such as high blood sugar, high cholesterol levels, hypertension, obesity, etc. And second of all, uh, this highlights the importance of developing prospective studies to come up with scores that can specifically assess for the cardiovascular risk in the vasculitis population. Thank you. Cool. Hey. Join us up here. Ed is nodding at me saying, we have good questions. I think this is a very hot topic of research. The cardiovascular risk that vasculitis presents. We are taught in medical school about uh, how big of a risk diabetes is, and that is why this is so surprising, that um, really on par with that, uh, we need to be thinking about that. But it also goes to show kind of how far we've come. Uh, you know, decades ago, it was just about getting through that first day or week or month um, or year. Um, but now that we have a better time horizon, we get, we have the luxury of thinking about like preventing heart attacks and like, you know, these secondary things that can happen. It also brings up a good point, I think, of it's so important just to keep your doctor up to date on your symptoms. And it might not always be your vasculitis. It might be uh, something else that's going on. Um, all right, let's see here. Oh, this is a great question. Maybe you're, maybe we're well positioned to to, to ask this, to answer this. All right, do you think the time it takes to take, uh, to do specific research will be shortened by technology and sp uh, specifically artificial intelligence or, you know, AI? What do you, what do you think? I think the answer is yes. <laughs> 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 Things are gonna be more efficient, I believe. And then, yeah. I hope so. Yeah, yeah that's a- emphasis on data sharing too, that to yeah. kind of not reinvent the wheel. I think that's probably another topic at the next symposium as well, is how AI has, it, it's moved so fast that I bet we'll have a lot to, um, to think about. Um, so this is a cardiovascular risk question. Do you anticipate that non anca vasculitis patients also have a high peripheral vascular disease risk? That's an interesting question. Actually, we did a study before assessing the cardiovascular risk between patients with ENCA and non-ENCA, and actually we didn't find an increased risk in the, in the we did, it, actually, we did find an increased risk in the non-ENCA population, but that is because we involve also patients with large vessel vasculitis. So I believe, um, you know, because of the blood vessel inflammation, again, the answer will be the same. There is inflammation, there is activation of multiple pathways, so there is also an increased cardiovascular risk in that subset of patients. There's a kind of a follow-up question here for, well, for, this is for Dr. Fussner or the, on the pulmonary side. 
you talked a lot about um, PR3. Do you think it's ap applicable? Be, uh, do you think you can apply it the same way to those patients with MPO? Great question. Um, potentially, yes. We're starting with PR3 just f to keep it clean, <laughs> to be honest, from a research perspective, to kind of say we have more well-defined groups. Um, um, and because the of that direct connection with the alpha-1 um, and PR3 itself being the inhibitor, but uh, I, I certainly think we plan to look at the MPO patients as well, um, but just kind of starting there for, for kind of cleanliness of the initial analysis, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, on the cardiology side, cardio cardiovascular risk side, should all patients with ANCA uh, vasculitis see a cardiologist or, or have a cardiology exam? An excellent question. Um, I think let's start with like assessing for regular risk factors. I think having a regular follow-up with your primary care physician at the very beginning to identify any fact, uh, risk factors such as hypertension, high cholesterol levels, smoking history, etc. And then you know if something pops up with those lab results and maybe consider if there is necessary actually a referral to a cardiologist. But I think at the very beginning, my answer will be no. I would say just have a regular follow-up with your primary care physician who are actually also excellent in identifying these factors and if necessary, a cardiology referral. Mm -hmm. I think the comment I would say to that is have a, we should probably have a lower threshold to refer to cardiology in patients with vasculitis in general. Um, many of our patients have a decreased performance now after the diagnosis like in terms of exercise and what they do compared to what they had before. And they might not be quite as active and thus not be able to kind of tell. And so any kind, any type of chest pain, shortness of breath, um, lightheadedness, that certainly needs to be evaluated because that might be one of the earliest clues. Um, let's see here. Do you? I'll kind of open it up to both of you. Do you think research in other autoimmune diseases will help us find breakthroughs in vasculitis specifically? The rheumatologist take that one first. <laughs> um, what was the question again? So do you think research in other autoimmune diseases mm -hmm. will help us kind of find breakthroughs or innovation in mm -hmm. vasculitis specifically? I think the answer is yes. Because at the end of the day, some of these diseases actually, you know, share a common like pathophysiology. So I think having research in other areas will be also helpful to try to find answers to some of the questions in the vasculitis field. Sure. And then there's a really good one here that's that's more general. How did the COVID pandemic affect both of your research? Well, my research wasn't affected by the pandemic, uh, fortunately, because it was just basically a national database that we have access to. So I didn't have to see the patients in person. So that was yeah, the yeah. benefit of the type of research that we did. What about you, Dr. Fausner? Pretty substantial effect, I would say. So in a few ways, so clinically, you know, certainly got pulled into um, a lot more clinical service time, you know, a lot more time in the ICU and in the hospital in that um, with the pandemic. And then as far as research, part of my research is um, is um, getting bronchoalveolar lavage samples from patients um, with, with vasculitis, but also not vasculitis for comparison. And we were doing almost none of those during the pandemic because of the, we call the aerosol generation um, and the risk to the team and, and everybody involved doing those types of procedures. So it was a pretty, pretty, big, pretty big hit. And then just, Shipping and staffing and yeah. all, everything that affected the rest, you know, the, the rest yeah. of the globe too, definitely affected uh, the research side. So, I feel like we're on a rebound, but yeah. it was a pretty rough that, couple of years. <laughs> that's good. The um, it's good to see kind of like how it sub can substantially affect uh, research and how it did sus substantially affect research and how maybe some of the more database level things mm -hmm. could still be done. You know. And that was a massive study that yeah. she did, 100,000 100, patients with vasculitis. Amazing. That's amazing. Um, there's one very specific question cardiovascular-wise. Is it, is it common for patients with MPA to first present as a flutter, which is a, kind of an arrhythmia of the heart? I think I will defer that question to you yeah. as a clinical expert. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've seen it a time or two, but 
Um, it, I wouldn't say it's common. I think it's, it's quite rare, actually. And when somebody presents with atrial flutter or any kind of heart rhythm, there's just a long list of things that could be causing that. And so vasculitis certainly is on the list, but it's really far down. And that is one of those reasons that sometimes diagnosis takes a while um, is because it, to have confidence in a diagnosis of a rare disease, sometimes the work has to be done to take the really common things off. And that can be time consuming and frustrating. Difficult, challenging sometimes. Any other questions uh, from the from the group? Well, I think these were two great sessions looking at our uh, early investigators and the work they're doing, both clinically and research-wise. Uh, the the round of applause I want you to give now is not just for these two up here, but it, it is for these two up here, but for, for everyone else, all the other investigators um, that the VF has supported. We're so very proud of you.